Welcome to Flourishment, the podcast on living life as you were meant to, so you can flourish. Welcome, everyone. I have an amazing woman of God with me today. Kim de Blaycourt is an international speaker and the award-winning author of Until We All Come Home and I Call You Mine. Kim is an adoptive parent and serves as the president of Nourished Hearts, an international orphan care nonprofit. Welcome, Kim. I'm so glad that we are here together today. Oh, Tina, it's just so good to be here. This has been quite the ordeal, just even getting to chat with you for a little bit. Yes, I think it's appropriate to our topic. We're going to talk about perseverance, and we had to persevere through, what was it, four different reschedulings for this recording? Oh, yeah, it seems like at least. (laughs) At least. So we're going to talk about how to cultivate perseverance. And a lot of people are struggling with getting through hard times and persevering instead of despairing and giving up right now. And I would love for you to talk about your personal story with perseverance and why this is a topic that you can speak to for sure. And isn't that funny? It took me years to realize that this would be a topic that people would want to hear from me. You would have thought that after our almost an ordeal of an international adoption, that perseverance would have been a natural topic to come to mind. And yet it's really only come about, I'd say, the last three years. It's very interesting to me how God works sometimes. Yes, we had an international adoption that was anything but typical. We are so pro-adoption, not only, I guess you'd say civically minded or socially minded, but definitely Christian hearted. I still remember the night my husband and I were sitting on the hillside, little known to me, he was about to propose to me. But at the time we were just talking as we were waiting for the fireworks to start. It was on 4th of July back in 19... 97, I believe. And he said, Kim, I don't think I'll ever move away from my hometown, not while my parents are still alive. And I think you should know that about me. And I said, Oh, okay, interesting. And uh, he was the only sibling left in the area, everybody else had moved out. And I think he felt a sense of responsibility. And his parents are just lovely people, very easy to to feel protective toward them. And he asked me, is there anything that I should know about you? And, you know, that should have been a clue to me. Oh, we're having this kind of serious turn in the conversation. (laughs) But I said, yes, um, I always wanted to have a mixed family of both biological children and adopted children, at least one of each. And um, I'm coming to find out that that's not everybody's desire. And, you know, you should probably know that about me. And he goes, really? Everybody doesn't feel that way, even Christians? And I said, no, they really don't. And he said, well, I don't know why. He said, it seems like a perfectly natural thing for a Christian to do. And obviously, he asked me to marry him. And we're still living that fairy tale out. But um, that's how it started. While we were in Ukraine uh, doing the adoption, God just had a different plan for me. And I think sometimes I know I can be so stubborn that the little pebbles at the window just don't work anymore and God has to throw a brick. (laughs) (laughs) And that's kind of the way I felt with the adoption now that I can look back 10, 11 years ago, right? And I can say, yeah, I can see that now. He was getting a hold of me turning me upside down, shaking out everything inside me and refilling all over again. Mm. So what happened is we left, I believe, May 12th, and I didn't step foot on United States soil again until April 25th of the next year. I had packed for four weeks. I did stick in six weeks worth of medication, I remember. And that I lived out of that suitcase for the next year. 
in a time it involved in an international adoption that everyone around us in the country of Ukraine was telling us we were never going to win. And there comes a time during a trial like that, that you have to ask yourself where you place your trust. Because the trust thing becomes a huge factor in perseverance. We focus as humans on the why. Why me? Why do you have to make this point during something so beautiful? Why are so many people turning away from us or discouraging us on this? Why, 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 right? Rather than who do you trust? Who do you trust regardless if the answer is yes or no, or life or death, or riches or poverty, or sickness or health? Who do you trust? And I think that is the key element to what I've personally taken away. And then, of course, there's this whole writing and speaking and doing ministry um, involving all of God's children, not only vulnerable children, but orphan children as well, that he always seems to have had a heart for. So God taught you to trust in him instead of looking at your circumstances. That would be a key point in how to cultivate perseverance. Yes. And one of the main points, I really think, Tina, the what I found out was you can't trust somebody completely to the point that an answer of yes or no to your deepest heartfelt question no longer matters anymore. I mean, that's a lot of trust. You cannot have that kind of trust unless you know that other person intimately. And I found out that I had kept God kind of superficial. And it was a hard place to be when the storm came, right? And I remember my husband and uh, our daughter, our biological daughter, returning to the United States without me. And I was going to finish up the adoption. And then I didn't see them again for six months. That is hard. But what it did was it put me on such a level with God that whenever I feel like I've wandered away, I am just zooming back to his side. I don't want any kind of distance in between myself and my father, because once you once you've gotten to know him and you are that close and you have that relationship and you've finally been able to let go of the anxiety and the worry and the matter of yes and no, the why no longer come. But there's a couple other things I think that really come with that cultivating perseverance as well. The first thing I remember thinking about actually wasn't even the trust part. That was actually, that came last out of everything. The first thing that came to me was my daily need for God. I noticed that I wanted to plan everything all the time, that I wanted to know what was coming. As a matter of fact, that was more important to me sometimes, I think, than it took over my prayer life, wanting to know what was coming next, asking continuously for reassurance that if I stayed in this country, away from my family, lost my job, we went into almost practical financial ruin. Um, if we did all this, that God was going to assure me that this boy was going to become our son, and I wasn't going to have to make that trip of taking him back to the orphanage and trying to explain why I was leaving him there. I never received it because he was asking me to trust him without it. And all of us have been in these areas of perseverance, right, Tina? 
where we've had something that we've struggled with and it's always different levels. This was my big one, you know, but to be able to get to that point that the reassurance and the whys no longer matter is the daily aspect, I think of it, because that's how the relationship is formed. But in Matthew chapter six, there's a great passage from about, let me find it here, verse 30 through 34. I'm going to read it to you out of the message because in this aspect, it really comes through a, a lot better, I think, than, than the King James Version does to me. It says in Matthew 6, 30 through 34, if God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting, so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things. But you both know God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Isn't that a beautiful interpretation, translation of, of, of this passage. Yes. I love that translation. It's showing us God's heart that he yes. loves us and we can trust that love. Yes. And it's focused on today. I, I'm also reminded of the Lord's prayer. Give us this day, our daily bread. We're not looking back. We're not dwelling over all the mistakes that Satan so loves to bring up, especially when I'm trying to go to sleep. And we're not worrying or having anxiety over tomorrow. We're asking for today. We're focusing on today because people who don't know God fuss over the other things. We just delight in being with him today. And I think that was the first really hard lesson I had to learn was, was to try to make the most out of each day that I was there trying to learn Russian, how to count in Russian, daily buying groceries, just things that I was totally unaccustomed to, and all the while trying not to appear American. Huh. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Now that I look back, I can laugh. That is the really the first big lesson, I think, is keeping everything daily. So trusting God, keeping everything daily, and I can just see your relationship with God deepening as he's growing your faith. Oh, but I wasn't an e easy student. I don't want to <laughs> create any illusion of this. Of, of me being gracious or anything, especially in the beginning. I just wasn't. I was just a hot mess, Tina, especially after my husband and our eight-year-old, then she was eight, year old daughter left. It was, uh, it was a relief because I know how it was even harder for them than it was for me because I had at least been to Ukraine once before on a mission trip. But um, culture shock is a real thing. And a post-Soviet culture and an American culture are almost like um, mirrored images. Everything's kind of backwards. It was that different. They've actually grown closer together. We've grown closer to their culture and they've grown, grown closer to ours. So we're starting almost to meet in the middle at this point. I'm sure due mainly to the internet. But it was definitely a, a different experience. It was a very shocking one and a different way of life, but it does really pull you to God's side because daily I was depending on him. Daily I was concerned about shopping or carrying money or caring for this little boy who was trapped in between the orphanage and going home. 
And so we were constantly changing places of living. We were constantly seeking out people and meeting with people that could possibly help us. And through it all, I wanted God to get the glory for this deliverance that everybody told us was never going to happen. And that's basically the story you find in our first book, Until We All Come Home. It's just about that one year slice of life that just kind of chronicles. God is so gracious. I was journaling everything. Then with the writing talents of Ginger Cole Baba coming along and writing everything down, it was just wonderful. But it really kind of puts you there. And through that experience is when I learned about the daily aspect of living with God and that it builds that trust. But it also showed me his very overwhelming love for us. Have you ever heard of, do you know what a bummer lamb is, Tina? No, I've never heard of that before. When when we were younger, we lived on a small five acre farm, but really out there. I mean, we had a huge cornfields near us. And then I don't know what direction, but on the other side, (laughs) we had a huge sheep farmer. And this is down in Southwest Michigan area. And I remember the day I was the oldest. I was, I want to say I was probably in fifth grade and the farmer from up the road brought us this lamb. I mean, and this thing was tiny. I remember saying to my mom, mom, what's wrong with his neck? Because that lamb was hanging his head at such an awkward angle. And the farmer explained to me, this is a twin and the ewe has rejected him. And the lamb is distraught from his mother's rejection. And I want to tell you right now, young lady, don't get too attached. Because most of these lambs don't make it. But my brothers and I were, we love that little lamb so much. It wasn't even a week later. I remember my mom telling us, don't love that lamb so much. You're going to love the wool right off him. (laughs) (laughs) And that little lamb not only made it, he thrived. And the parallel is just unmistakable. I mean, how many times is Christ compared to the good shepherd? And how many times does he have to care for us when our head is hanging so low that it's at an awkward angle to everybody around us? And I just love that story of the shepherd and the sheep or the shepherd and the lamb. That's the love of our Savior. That overwhelming, going to love the wool right off you kind of love. And when we're in the middle of a struggle, Satan loves. He just thrives on hiding that love from us, from diminishing that love that is there. And it's, I think, the, the most important thing to remember when you're going through a struggle or a time of perseverance, that overwhelming love, that picture of the shepherd, that loving the wool off you kind of love. He says, we will never be separated from that love. No matter how hard Satan tries to convince you otherwise, listener, please always remember I remember just crying out to God for me to feel that love, for me to never forget that love. And I know how much I loved that little shaved head boy that I didn't know if I was ever going to be able to call son. And if I could love somebody like that, how much more does God love him? How much more does God love me? And I think those three things are the beginning of cultivating an entire lifetime of perseverance, Tina. It's it's the daily aspect and relationship with God. It is remembering that 
overwhelming love, a love that we humanly, I'm convinced we can't even understand it, that we don't know the depth of it. And that trust that comes with that relationship, together it forms such a strong identity as a daughter or son of the Most High God. That is such a beautiful image. And it's so heart gripping too. And I love that you've cultivated perseverance with God's help, but you didn't need to be the perfect student for him to teach it to you. He helped you to develop something you never could have developed on your own. And I think that's encouraging to those of us who are listening, thinking, I just don't have what it takes to cultivate perseverance. I'm someone who despairs easily. I would give up. I felt the exact same way. If you would have told me that anything like this would have happened before the adoption, before our Ukraine saga, if you will, I would have told you you were crazy. I am just so every day. There is nothing remarkable about me except the God who lives in me. It's incredible to me sometimes. I still haven't, the only time I ever read the book all the way through to relive it was when I did the audiobook for it. <laughs> and at that time, I remember just trying to keep it even keel and just try to tell the story because if I got down too deep in those emotions again, I knew I was going to never make it through, you know? I think sometimes we all have that feeling, oh, I could never do that. How many people have come up to me and said, I could have never done what you did. But that's the day-to-day aspect. We, You learn to focus on just today. I didn't know it was going to be a year. I didn't know what I was signing up for. I just knew this little boy didn't have a person in the world. And he called me Mamushka mommy in Russian, and looked at me with his big blue eyes. Uh, Our hearts were instantly, when we first met him that first day in the orphanage, my husband and I turned to each other and we said, this is the boy we're supposed to adopt. That's what we had prayed for. We asked that since we got a choice of who to adopt in Ukraine, you know, a lot of adoptions don't have that. We were convinced, at least I was, I was convinced that I would mess it up. I almost wanted somebody to be assigned to me because then I could imagine that that was God's designation rather than me making a choice in there, messing things up. What it really showed was God's providence all the way along. I can look back now on every aspect of what was a wonderfully horrible time, right? And take away from it so many things that were right in front of me. But at the time, I had a hard time appreciating. Listener, if you're struggling with something right now, I want you to just get through today and know how much our God loves you. Our Father, our Heavenly Father just loves you so much. And to remember to develop that trust. It will come. No matter how stubborn you are like me, that you're a slow learner perhaps, or that you think you just don't have it in you to get through, just ask for enough for today. And I believe you will find out like I did. His grace is sufficient. That's so good. And I think maybe that's a fourth thing you could add in there about a key to perseverance is remembering Perseverance happens one day at a time, one moment at a time, one step at a time. It doesn't happen the whole journey all at once. Yes. Very good, Tina. Love it. Thank you for sharing your part in your personal story. The beautiful things that have happened through the ordeals that you suffered. You would not have experienced what you found on the other side of that if you had given up. But God was the one that empowered you to persevere. It wasn't on your own strength. Oh, yes. Not at all. Not at all. (laughs) I think that the main thing in your story that we can come away with is it doesn't have anything to do with us. It has to do with us trusting God to be the one to do the heavy lifting and give us the strength to persevere when we don't have it. 
Oh, amen. That's exactly what it is. Because, you know, we think that we know God. We think that we trust God as we live in our houses and we attend our church and we hang out with our friends and go get coffee whenever we want, you know, all these little things that we enjoy. But boy, take us out of that comfort zone, plunk us down someplace else and say, there you are and see how quickly we could fall apart (laughs) if it wasn't for our huge God, the way that he sends his spirit to, to live in us. And sometimes what the enemy means to be our destruction, what he wants to take away and destroy us like that lamb that would have been completely lost and would have never had life beyond just a few moments after its birth. We instead enjoy the love of a gracious, generous God who wants to take care of us and allow us to thrive, not just survive through this, but thrive because we have trusted him. So that's the good news is that no matter how dark things are around us, we can trust that God loves us enough to sustain us through the hardships and bring us into this richness of what it is to know how much God loves us. Oh, amen, Tina. I just love talking to you. (laughs) Love talking to you too. I just love the beauty of your story and your heart. And you've brought from this a wonderful ministry to the least of these, basically. Uh, Tell us a little bit more about that. Nourished Hearts, uh, nourishedhearts.org is um, an organization that uh, is working primarily in the country of Ukraine, our son's birth country. We work with local churches there to encourage them to open their doors to the need of children around them. You know, so many days a church will sit empty. And yet I can't tell you how many countries and cities and villages I've been in and out of with the different orphan care work that I've done. And in these towns where there's not even a post office, there's a church. I think God already has the solution to uh, the world's orphan crisis and to vulnerable children crying all over the world. And it's the church. So Nourished Hearts works to encourage the church to open their doors and to meet this need. And I'll tell you, the evangelical aspect of this is that you're bringing the vulnerable and the needy right to the door of the church. I mean, can you imagine the heart of a mother or father who sees the church carry, helping them care for their kids and keep them safe while they're away at work or to help them with their homework? or to make sure they got a hot meal that night. That's the kind of work that Nourished Hearts does through the churches that we partner with. And the last two years, I enjoyed consulting with McLean Bible Church out of Virginia with uh, Orphan Care Ethiopia as well, just as a volunteer consultant to work with Naomi, their very vision-oriented leader. I've just stepped away from that because I had to get back to my own organization, but God showed me so much through the need in Ethiopia. The needs are different in every area, but they all are suffering from the lack of having God in their life. And that's really what the orphan and vulnerable children care work is about. It's an evangelical outreach because As Gary Van Dyke from Food for Orphans, an an organization that I used to work with, he taught me this well right at the beginning when it was just starting out. He said, Kim, what good is it if I fill their belly if they still go to hell? Now, he's a very blunt speaker, (laughs) but it's right. We can't let this work become about the social work aspect. We have to always remember that it's an evangelical outreach through the church. And that's what Nourished Hearts is all about, Tina. How can people support what you're doing and get a hold of your resources and stay connected with you, Kim? Um, They can follow our Facebook page. Again, that's Nourished with an ED on the end and then Hearts, plural. And or they could go to NourishedHearts.org if you're interested in um 
I have started a book about perseverance, Tina. You know, speaking usually leads to writing. And if you'd like to follow that aspect, you might want to check me out at kimdeblaycourt.com. And I'll make sure you get the links too for any of your listeners. Thank you so much, Kim. I treasure all the beautiful things that are coming from your life, your ministry, and your writing and speaking work that you do so obediently as you walk in step with Jesus every day. And it's a joy every time I get to chat with you. Yes, we haven't got to see each other this last year. I hope we do this year, Tina. Yes, Kim, I do too. And I hope that all of you listening will get in touch with Kim and receive her resources and support. If you feel led to support her ministry or a ministry of your own connected with that ministry, make sure you check out Nourished Hearts as well. Thank you for listening and be sure to come back for the next episode of Flourishment. Flourishment.